innovation and the knowledge infrastructure in Colombia. Uh, as we all know, new technologies are changing the way in which we communicate with each other, the way in which we produce uh, goods and services, and the way in which we govern ourselves. But in order to reap all the benefits from these new technologies, we must build um, a good ecosystem that can support these technologies, and it can, uh, the ecosystem has also uh, to be able to support our citizens and support their privacy and security. So today, we have four panelists who are going to talk about uh, how can we build this knowledge ecosystem in Colombia. Please welcome our panelists. Hola, buenas tardes todos. Uh, bienvenidos. Muchas gracias uh, a venir a este panel. Um, welcome. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here. A uh, brief note on housekeeping, just in case it wasn't mentioned before. Um, you will notice that the event's being filmed for people who can't be here in person. Um, so we may get some questions from uh, people watching remotely. Also, we have a translator. So uh, if you prefer to listen along in Spanish, you may. And there will be an opportunity for questions from the audience later. So you may speak in Spanish if you prefer. So my name is Alex Rutherford. I am a research scientist in MIT Media Lab as of about two months. Uh, I'm working on investigating human cooperation in the age of social media and artificial intelligence. Before I joined the Media Lab, I worked in the United Nations, uh, in the UN General, uh, Secretary General's Office and UNICEF Office of Innovation in New York. And that included projects with various UN agencies and political organizations, excuse me, public organizations on how we can use new sources of data to inform development policy and humanitarian response. And that also involved some field work in Latin America and the Middle East. And a long time ago, I was a physicist, but please don't ask me any questions about physics because my physics is worse than my Spanish. <laughs> okay, uh, so the structure will be as follows. I will introduce our three fantastic panelists. Um, they will each have a chance to introduce themselves through some recent work that they've been doing. I have a few questions to kick off our discussion. And then we will open it up to you here and everyone watching, uh, watching remotely. Uh, so please start thinking of clever questions to, uh, to challenge them. Okay, so I'll start with Professor Clara Inez Pardo. Clara is presently a consultant for Banco Interamericano de Desarrollo and the Organización Latinoamericana de la Energía. Additionally, she holds the position of professor at Universidad del Rosario in Bogota. Clara has worked as an international auditor with experience across consulting, research, and teaching in topics such as environmental management, workplace health and safety, integral auditing, integral management system implementation, and R&D with manufacturing companies. Clara has an impressive array of qualifications, including a Bachelor in Food and Environmental Engineering, a Magister in Environmental uh, Management, and she followed that with a PhD in Economics from the University of Wuppertal, Germany, and a postdoc in Energy Policy and Climate Studies from the Royal Institute of Technology, Energy and Climate Studies in Sweden. Professor Sandy Pentland needs no introduction, but I will nevertheless give him an introduction. Sandy directs the MIT Connection Science and Human Dynamics Labs, and previously helped to create and direct the MIT Media Lab and the Media Lab Asia in India. Forbes recently declared him one of the seven most powerful data scientists in the world, along with the uh, along with the founders of Google and the Chief Technical Officer of the United States. He has received numerous awards and prizes, such as the McKinsey Award from Harvard Business Review, the 40th anniversary of the Internet from DARPA, and the Brandeis Award for work in data privacy. He is a founding member of the advisory boards for Google, AT&T, Nissan, and for the UN Secretary General. He is a member of the U.S. National Academy of Engineering and a leader within the World Economic Forum. And we're very pleased that he can join us today. And last but not least, Felipe Zarate 
is the general partner of Ventures EPM. Ventures EPME. Disculpe me, Malik Centro. Uh, Ventures EPM launched its first fund, FCP Innovacion SP, in 2003 with 40 million US dollars under management. 2013. 2013. Ah, I beg your pardon. In 2013 with 40 million dollars under management. And they have executed eight investments to date. Felipe's role at Ventures EPM leverages 22 years of experience in top management, private equity, and venture capital, as well as business development across South America, North America, Europe, and Southeast Asia. Felipe holds a BSc in Civil Engineering from Yafit University in Colombia and an MBA from HEC School of Management in France. So we have a uh, bewildering array of experience and qualifications up here uh, in this panel. As Isabella said, we're gathered here at this conference to discuss how Colombia is situated in this pivotal moment in history. Many of the people at this conference and in this room are well placed as current and next generation leaders uh, to guide Colombia to a vision of increased peace and prosperity. As part of this goal, we would like to focus on the role of scientific and knowledge infrastructure in achieving this vision. So I'm going to dive right in and uh, ask my first question of the panel, and we'll go Clara, Sandy, Felipe in that order. And my first question for the panel is, what is the current state of the knowledge, knowledge infrastructure in Colombia as you see it? And do you have a favorite success story or proof point that you would like to share? And I believe we have some visual aids if the technology gods smile upon us. Okay. Better money kill money here. Okay. Uh, thank you for invitation. Uh, uh, Colombian Observatory of Science and Technology is a non-profit organization of uh, Colombian National System of Science and Technology. Every year, Colombian Observatory uh, calculates the main indicators of science, technology, and innovation for the country. Uh, in this calculation, uh, it's important to measure science, technology, and innovation from different approach. This approach also is what is the investments, what is the actual money you, the science, technology, and innovation have in the country. Other important is the in resource. In resource, it's important what is the how many masters or PhD uh, programs and human resource have in the country, and what is the technology science, because it's important to analyze what is the possible to improve this formation. Uh, second is what is the how many research and research group have the Colombia, and what is the thematic of these studies, because. Uh, you find more research groups in social science, but in STEAM it's not easy, it's no more groups you find. Uh, other important uh, point is the results. You have resources uh, as inputs, for example, investment, human resources, and others. And what is the results of this is, in, uh, this is resource in science and technology and innovation? For this reason, calculate the, what is the uh, scientific production of Colombia in papers, chapters, and others industrial property rights, for example, patents, how many patents have Colombia, uh, results in innovation uh, from a, a service of innovation of DANE, and what is the effects of information communication and technologies, an important point, what is the scientific culture of <coughs> Colombian people. This is important point because more uh, Colombian people uh, no, don't understand what is the role of science, technology, and innovation in the society. And this is indicators is important to compare what is international perspective and also consciences. What is the main indicators of consciences to develop this science, technology, and innovation? Um, this is the last uh, data of this is the time series of the investments on science, technology, and innovation in Colombia. Uh, you compare uh, the trends, the trends indicate a, a slow, slow growth in the investments in uh, science, technology, and innovation activities, and also research and development activities. Uh, the best 
uh, years for the investment in science, technology, and innovation in Colombia was uh, 2030 and 2040 because royalties begin a fund especially to invest in science, technology, and innovation. Uh, in this moment, the uh, trend is maintained, and the goal of government was 1% of uh, gross product, product, domestic product in the science, technology, and innovation is not easy, and it, 20 years is the compromise of different governments, but in this moment, the investment is 0.67%, and 0.24 in research and development. This is, uh, data is very slow in comparison with other countries, especially developed countries. Okay. Okay. Uh, Colombian Observatory also the compare what is the innovation in the Colombian regions. This is the war in two times, and in this, in this moment to calculate the third version of this is index. Uh, this index uh, is the CMIL with the global innovation in this specific for Colombian departments. Uh, the national average of, uh, global, of department innovation is 32%. Uh, the best departments and region is Bogota and Antioquia. Uh, this is index have different uh, advantage. The first advantage is to analyze what is the main inputs to in uh, innovation. Uh, this is inputs is, for example, sophistication of market, sophistication of financial, infrastructure, uh, government institutions, and this important to analyze what is the inputs and also what is the outputs. In outputs to an analyze what is the mm, a creative market, for example, and what is the science production in Colombia. Uh, this indicator uh, has, uh, is a key to government to design adequate policies to determine what is the main instruments to improve and to strengthen innovation. Uh, you find this is data, you find the more this, uh, innovation disparities in Colombian regions. Uh, for example, the first, ta the first uh, uh, rank is Bogota and Antioquia. And the other regions, for example, Chocó, Cesar, Córdoba, this is the departments without you find innovation. For this reason, it's important to determine this is index with, uh, to take decision according to these results. The last compass to determ determine it, the, uh, when government for example, is necessary to make different investment projects to analyze this index to determine what is the priorities to investment and innovation. Uh, this is the context what Colum uh, Colombia have a structure of the inputs and outputs in innovation, science and technology, and other possibilities to improve this is investment and also improve growth, productivity, and development. Uh, it's important to take uh, according data and the effort of Colombian observatories every year in the first semester to uh, take the data and, stat and official statistics of science, technology, and innovation for Colombia. Thank you, Clara. And the same question to Sandy. Um, well, I think I focus on a different area, which is um, IT infrastructure. Uh, and um, particularly um, what can be done to promote greater innovation uh, and greater social capital, basically more even distribution of social capital. And uh, the view is, is that we're at a inflection point or a change point where the things that are required are, uh, for progress are things that depend on data data access, data regulation, uh, because that's the thing that promotes and permits AI optimization and new services. So um, there's sort of a gold rush all around the world. You see the US, China investing in AI. And uh, uh, if you don't sort of get on that train, you risk being uh, rather fully commodified. 
So, so this is an important new type of infrastructure. So the current state isn't very good in Colombia, but it's not very good anywhere, um, except that people are putting enormous amounts of investment in it, and you have to compete with that. So what are the things that, that Colombia needs to do to avoid being commodified in all of its other industries? And uh, there are a few basics that are relatively easy to do uh, conceptually, uh, but are sometimes difficult to do uh, practically and politically. So one is secure digital identity. Uh, you have your real world identity, but typically identity in digital space is um, not recognized, often fraudulent, in the hands of other people, not yourself. And what that does is that leads to high levels of uh, fraud, corruption, discourages investment, discourages uh, any sort of system that begins to manage real world uh, resources based on digital infrastructure. So the notion of identity is a key. Um, various nations are making <coughs> attempts towards this or movements. So India, for instance, have their Adahar system. Uh, which has already shown rather large effects in terms of reducing corruption and improving GDP. Um, some small countries like uh, Estonia, Singapore have made uh, very, very marked progress in this. It's just, it's, it's table, what they say, table stakes for the new game. It's the thing you have to do to begin to be competitive. A second thing is data rights. Um, in most parts of the world, it's not clear who owns the data. Is it the citizen? Is it the company? Is it the government? Um, I was involved in constructing, uh, motivating Europe's privacy law, which, uh, of course, gives rights to citizens, but also defines rights for companies. And uh, what that does is that begins to unleash uh, the power of businesses that are based on data because it becomes clear what you can and can't do. Many businesses were held back, many services were held back because it wasn't clear what was legal, it wasn't clear what was ethical. And so as they begin to clarify that, that opens up a, a whole new range of, of things. A third thing is open data. So leaders in this area are the UK, uh, United States, some other countries. Because the access to data is important for new industries, it's also important for government for accountability and transparency. So what that looks like is taking government data and making it available on the web or in other ways that are usable particularly by businesses, by non-governmental agencies, by other people. Um, and uh, we actually have an experiment that's paid for by the government of France, Telefonica, and BBVA in Colombia uh, to be able to make not only government avail data available, but also data from Telefonica, data from the bank, data from transportation, so that you can get something that looks like a census map that shows the amount of spending in every neighborhood, the amount of communication and, and uh, travel between neighborhoods so that you can see about equity and access in the real world, which helps people plan public health, plan transportation, plan other sorts of business. So making this data available to all uh, is important economically, but also for accountability for government processes, which is important at the moment. Um, other things that support these three identity, data rights, and open data are, of course, investment in science and university and education, but particularly, I think, also in data literacy. So this should not just be people with degrees. Uh, it should be something that every four-year-old knows how to, you know, look at a map, understand what some of these things mean, be able to engage in discussion. Uh, because otherwise you don't have the political discussion based on facts, based on the data. You need to have people able to do this, to understand it, to use these tools, 
uh, if you're going to have greater accountability and greater transparency. Uh, so we have a couple projects. We're working with um, Impulsa to help them forge um, their data policy uh, for innovation going forward. And we're working with uh, uh, several governmented entities, but also uh, countries, uh, uh, industry, to make data more open. Uh, and uh, those are things that hopefully will, will uh, lead to progress in various ways. Thank you. And Felipe. I need a oh, yes. pointer. Thank you. So first of all, thanks to both the Harvard and MIT uh, Colombian associations for having me here. And second of all, I want to say hi to my mom watching me on YouTube. So this... Okay, so to answer your question, I have um, two or three slides about what I consider is a, a good story to tell. Still not a success story until we start having exits from the investments that we've been able to do uh, from Ventures EPM. But I think it's still a, you know, a, a case study of an example of how investing in uh, knowledge through entrepreneurship Investing in innovation through applied technologies uh, has been something that we've been able to uh, execute pretty well on at Ventures EPM. So I want to give people a little bit of context. I know not everybody here is familiar with EPM or, or even with the Colombian market, but very, very quickly, EPM is Colombia's biggest utility. It's a... Um, uh, you know, a leading utility uh, in terms of its performance and the way that the company is operated. And uh, just giving you some numbers there. Um, these numbers are in Colombian pesos, but, you know, EPM in terms of, of size is, is, a comp is a company of about, uh, you know, 12, almost 13 billion pesos in sales, a bit of around 2.3 uh, billion pesos as well. So this gives you a sense of how uh, the company uh, you know, uh, behaves financially, and uh, something very particular about EPM is that EPM is a multi-service utility. So it's not your classic utility in the sense that there's only one service, uh, energy or water or, or waste management, but it's a multi-service utility across energy, water, waste, and telecommunications. So it's a, it, it's a big conglomerate, it's a complex company, and, uh, and the idea that that I'm going to describe to you is... Uh, something very, you know, very, uh, very, very showing of the kinds of things that conglomerates and big groups can do uh, to to search for innovation and, and and invest in it and develop knowledge around that. Uh, just the last thing that I would say about EPM to add a little bit to its complexity is that it's a multinational company with uh, operations in Mexico, Salvador, Guatemala, Panama, Colombia, and Chile. Just that this slide I will kind of you know, breeze through, but uh, EPM is either number one or number two in most of the markets that it participates in. And, and nonetheless, the, the company hasn't been sitting on its laurels as the incumbent operator and has experimented with the corporate venture uh, idea that I'm about to tell you about. So, so where does this all kind of come from? So basically, if you, if you look at all those elements that I just mentioned to you, we're talking about... Um, a, a multinational company that has about 48 moving parts, which are its 48 companies that make up the conglomerate. And all of those companies are, in aggregate, serving about 20 million customers. 20 million customers that are now starting to have uh, an unprecedented access to, uh, to information and to options around the kind of service that they're getting, even if it's a utility, right? So everybody takes for granted that, uh, you know, you, you, you flick on the switch, you get energy, you turn on the tap, you have water, you, you put your garbage can outside and the waste gets collected. But as uh, Sandy just mentioned, you know, customers are expecting more. So they have options as to who is going to retail energy for them, uh, the companies that can that can offer them other options in terms of the, of the service that they're going to get. So... All these challenges are lining up to make uh, for a very challenging moment, even 
for uh, for monopolies or duopolies or, or, or dominant companies in, in, in almost every sector. And of course, utilities are not an exception. So when you take all those strategic challenges that EPM has as a group and you align those with, you know, with the, with, with the, the region that we hope to impact uh, from, uh, you know, from a geographical standpoint, we've developed a, uh, basically the criteria, very typical criteria for uh, a corporate venture fund, which is basically what, what we've set up uh, under Ventures EPM. And these criteria here at the bottom are, are, you'll see are exactly the same criteria as any investor would have. We're basically looking for entrepreneurs that have a solution where our intelligent uh, capital, where, where our money will allow them to reach uh, uh, and accelerate all the cap capabilities that they need to, to develop their product and mature their product. So, so that's what we've been doing. Um, and to date, just to give you a sense of what we've been executing on, uh, the fund has analyzed uh, 559 investment opportunities. About uh, 30 or 33 of these have been uh, seen by our investment committees and our advisory committees, and we have executed eight investments uh, in, uh, in, you know, in, in the life of the fund. Uh, if you look at the topics in which we've invested, basically we invested in big data applied on energy, two investments are in renewables, uh, another two investments are in um, innovative approaches for waste, for municipal waste management, and three more examples are either cloud-based or, or IoT-based uh, based, uh, companies. And what that tells you is that regardless of what industry you're in, even if it's a very classic industry with a very boring infrastructure like a, you know, a, a big water main transporting you know, gallons of water, uh, everything that you're going to do going forward has to be based on innovation, based on technology. And those are the kinds of things that are going to take both your service offering and your operational performance to, to the point where you need to be. Uh, improving all those indicators is really the key at the end of the day. And having a differentiated uh, portfolio for clients is what it's all about. So this is a very long answer to your question. But what we've been doing at Ventures EPM is that we've been really through uh, the approach of taking a venture, a corporate venture investment approach, we've been, um, uh, we've been able to, to, to go hand in hand with entrepreneurs uh, and, and, and take all of their know-how and bring it into a big corporation, apply it, and, and, and make that uh, what we believe a, uh, you know, a, a differentiating factor for you know, for a for a very uh, classic utility. So we're we're going to continue to do this. Um, we will be launching a second fund uh, between now and the end of the year. So uh, you know, at, at that point, we will probably have something around like a hundred million dollars under management, so that we can continue investing in entrepreneurs uh, all over the region, which we've already done through investments in Colombia, in the U.S., in Guatemala, in Chile, and in Brazil. So that's, that's the story that kind of um, gives you some context about what we do. Thank you very much. Very exciting times. Um, Muchas gracias. <laughs> good, good accent. <laughs> um, so my next question for our panel members uh, somewhat follows on, um, and that concerns uh, what are meaningful measures of knowledge and innovation, infrastructure and capacity? and thinking about what these measures should be in light of our goal for a vision of Colombia in 2040. Uh, and I'm going to go from my right to left again, Clara, Sandy, Felipe. Um, uh, in the last decades, Colombian governments have formulated as objective to increase investments in research and development and science, technology, and innovation activities, and 1% as percentage of gross domestic product. Uh, were the best years were 2030 and 2040 by royalties in inclusion. In this moment, it's not clear what is the future of investments in research and development and science and technology in Colombia, because it's important to establish what is the programs of the, uh, from the new president. 
Uh, what is important in this point? In 2040, it's important uh, the Colombia government's uh, focus what is the best investment in science, technology, and innovation. Because it's important to analyze how improve uh, development and growth in the Colombia. Uh, other important point is the to valorize commodities. Colombia in this moment, in this moment only produce commodities. It's important to improve productivity, innovation, to evaluate these commodities. In this, op this is, the op is the main objective possible to increase productivity and innovation system in Colombia. Thank you, Clara. Um, so for meaningful measures, that, uh, you know, what I would look for in the area of, of information technology is First of all, simply passing the required legislation or regulation. doesn't necessarily have to be legislation. Um, and then the uh, amount of uptake of, of uh, new facilities like identity facilities, uh, data businesses, uh, uptake of open data. Um, so how many sort of efforts are making use of these new capabilities? the diversity of the uptake, so is it just in Bogota or the big cities or is it everywhere? You would certainly hope that it would be everywhere because one of the main problems that you see in, in Colombia is uh, wealth concentration and that leads to lots of problems. So you would like to be able to have a diversity of, of access and uptake of these facilities. And then one way to judge it, not immediately but uh, over a somewhat longer period, is the competitive position it gives you. So you should be able to see these sorts of capabilities allowing uh, Colombia to provide services to other Andean nations, to Latin America generally, and perhaps worldwide. Thank you, and same question to Felipe. Yeah, so, yeah, no, I agree with, with what's been said, and I guess I, I can't, uh, uh, not look at, at one of the big indicators that we're looking at as an ecosystem uh, when you when you measure the amount of money that is that is being invested uh, at the earlier stages of um, you know of entrepreneurship cycles right so so for us it's very important um, to to capture that data today is, is being captured by Col Capital which is the the Colombian uh, Association of Private Equity and, and Venture Capital. And when you look at, at where that number stands today in terms of absolute uh, dollars, you know, that are, that are, that are going into, into early stage companies, uh, you know, Colombia is still in the early phases of this. We have um, a certain number of seed funds or capital semilla. We have uh, uh, kind of a, a range of, of, of venture capital funds, Capital Emprendedor, and then we, we have a dominance of, of private equity, which is Capital Privado, and, and that's almost um, right now kind of a, a, a mirror image of what it should be, because if you look at what happens is that um, in that funnel of, of money and that funnel opportunity, where there should be the most investment, just like it is in in the United States or in, or in Europe and other places that have a more mature capital markets uh, industry, uh, you have most of the money going into the early stages. That's where uh, you, know, you, you should be looking at. Then you have, of course, the natural selection of the companies who are the most competitive ones. They survive, they get the venture funds, and then the, big, the companies that grow big enough, they get the private equity. And, and so that, for us, is a very, very important indicator that has to improve enormously in the in the seed and and venture uh, phases so we're, we're far we're far from that and then uh, you know Clara Clara Ines was mentioning a very important metric which is the percentage of uh, you know science technology and innovation investment as a percentage of of another bigger indicator which is GDP and uh, in uh, just to mention a case uh, in point in Medellin, we signed about three years ago something called the Pacto de la Innovación, which is the Innovation Pact. And this was uh, an effort where universities, private companies, and, and the municipality committed to reach 
uh, certain goals of investment of uh, GDP into science, technology, and innovation. And Medellin has basically uh, hit their original goal about a year earlier or so. And, and that was a kind of a good example of, you know, when, when everybody's kind of um, brought together by, by, that, by, that, uh, by that common objective, you can actually drive, you know, those, those numbers hopefully in the right direction. And I think we would all want to see those numbers, of course, uh, go, go up. So, uh, so those, those are the metrics. Um, and then another effort, which I think Sandy will like, is that the city of Medellin also started a big data project called MEDATA. And uh, MEDATA is basically that. It's uh, taking, we're gonna take everything that we have in, in, in the city. Medellin is still not smart. It's still, you know, it's kind of getting there. It's kind of a, it's not a smart city in the sense that, you know, that, that everybody thinks of where everything is connected, where there's data flowing everywhere, where there's highways of data. We're, we're still not, not there, but we have at this point enough intelligence in the city through sensors, uh, environmental sensors, traffic sensors, traffic cameras, uh, security cameras, all that, that a lot of the information can be digitized and can be shared with the citizens. You know, where are the, uh, where, where, what places are more secure, less secure, et cetera, et cetera. So, so we're, we're making kind of a big effort. And I think that hopefully we can measure what level of openness we're having with all the data that is, that is, that is being distributed by the municipality. We'll also have something to, to talk about in about a year or two. Excellent. Uh, following on somewhat from, uh, from Felipe's, um, Felipe's comment about ecosystems, in my native London, our startup uh, cluster is known as Silicon Roundabout, uh, not a particularly evocative name, but it is part of a broader trend of, of people trying to somehow uh, reproduce or emulate Silicon Valley or uh, Israel or Chile, uh, these, these very successful um, innovation ecosystems. So my, my question to the panel is, do you think that is uh, the right approach to, to emulate these, um, these successful ecosystems? And what do you see as the necessary components and incentives to fuel that kind of community? Okay. Um, According to the, uh, the uh, Regional Innovation Index of, uh, to calculate for Colombian Observatory of Science and Technology, it's important to determine the uh, big uh, disp regional disparities in my country. It's very, very complex. For example, uh, the best uh, rank is Bogota with the 69, uh, 69 points because other departments have low, lower to 20 points. This is the big problem in, in my country, the regional disparities to improve pro, uh, innovation and productivity. And the main problem also is the human resource. The regions have not innovation, have not human resource to improve innovation. Uh, in, in this uh, perspective, it's important, for example, to analyze in every region what is the possibilities to implement innovation especially according to the eco ecosystem, uh, innovation ecosystem, and also what is the uh, potential innovation in these regions. Because Colombia has more difference in, the, in different regions, and it's important to analyze these uh, pot pos uh, potentials to apply adequate innovation instruments. Uh, the idea is to decrease these disparities and to analyze what is the possibilities to uh, industrial productivity, to in ecosystem innovation, and analyze what is the best instruments. But the policy is differential in the region. This is important to the uh, policy makers. Isn't the similar innovation for all Colombia is not possible. It's necessary to analyze what is the different instruments according to the regions. So, um Ecosystems, I think, is an interesting thing to do. Um, I think that most countries go about it incorrectly um, because they tend to want to highly regulate it and have the government heavily involved. And I, I take a rather different approach. I think that uh, many countries don't have uh, equity rights 
Uh, so founders don't get treated well. Uh, that's a major problem, major disincentive. Um, they have great limitations on funding. So for instance, a current battle is around uh, what could be called crowdfunding, but can, can small or medium size, uh, uh, medium rich people invest in startups or not? That's a, for instance, in this country, that's in, illegal. It's sort of crazy, right? It's not, it's not that way, for instance, in the UK. And, and there's a huge battle beginning over that. I think it makes a big difference. Um, there's also this sort of um, short-term thing. Like, for instance, a typical thing that happens is universities uh, want to encourage spin-offs, but they also want to have a piece of the spin-off. But universities are terrible managers of innovation. I mean, just terrible. They, they, MIT, however, I mean, to get as an example, <laughs> just, just to take an, we, MIT does not take equity in spinoffs. You, you invent it, you go do it, right? There are certain variations on that, but, but um, you know, the, for instance, the venture classes that I teach, we try to make sure that you don't own anything. MIT helps you, but you don't own anything. They don't own anything. Um, and the same should be true of government. So for instance, in Europe, they have a lot of funds to support startups. The result is, is the, the country ends up adding all this paperwork and ownership so that no private equity investor would touch the company. So they, they get a year or two of, of runway and then they crash. Um, and then I think that there's a, a, a final thing that that is a psychological thing. So. Many of the students I have from Latin America generally, not Colombia in particular, uh, report that the, the word for entrepreneur is um, a very negative thing in the culture. So being an entrepreneur is sort of rather like being a thief. Uh, when, you, when you go home, you don't tell your, your mother that you're starting a company because she'll cry. It will be bad, right? So obviously that needs to, to change. Yep. Thank you. Yes, uh, interesting gamble from MIT not to take equity and hope that uh, all of the successful students remember them when it comes to make donations. Um, I feel that Felipe will uh, also have an interesting perspective on this question. Well, look, uh, I think that almost any discussion about uh, ecosystems and, and, and you know, startup uh, <coughs> Uh, benchmarks it always has the Silicon Valley example, and I think um, I think that Silicon Valley is is unique. You know, I think uh, I think Israel has its own set of uh, you know of, of strengths where it's been demonstrated beyond doubt that that you can have a thriving and uh, and, and 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 very fruitful uh, you know in, environmental uh, sorry uh, entrepreneurial um, you know environment. So. I think I think that that discussion I, I've almost like um, you know uh, left that discussion behind because I think that whenever you think of, of of what you can do with what you have, that's your starting point. And you know, in uh, in Colombia, I think that that you have um, a different perspective of that in er every everywhere you go, almost in a way, right? So if you go to Santander. For example, Santander is a, is a department where people are self-made, where you're proud of the fact that you've come from the bottom up. And, and, and so that spirit impregnates everything that people do in Santander, right? So, and Antioquia has something like that. Uh, and, and, uh, and when you look at how that reflects on the capacity for somebody to actually take that decision, which Sandy was uh, sometimes describing, uh, as, uh, as, as, as being risky in the eyes of your, your parents or of your classmates or anybody like that, it, it, it really is a big factor uh, when, you know, when, when you see what you have. And, um, and, and the other thing that, that also changes region to region besides that entrepreneurial spirit or, 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 or the, you know, the hunger to start your own thing and make it successful is are all the mechanisms that are around you in, in that particular place. So unfortunately, uh, we have one centralized program, which has been run by Bancoldex, which is Impulsa, 
and Impulsa has been has been very very uh, persistent and, and very very uh, constant in the last uh, five six years in uh, in in uh, with with seed funding, but then when you see the follow through that that has had, uh, which almost depends on what you can get in a, in a, in the next phase, that's when the you know the the gaps start to be to be obvious. So I think that more than emulating. Um, you know, Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley has its own, you know, set of strengths, and it's a very, you know, unique place. Uh, but I think that what we need to look at is, you know, region by region, city by city, and then as as much as possible, but without calling it government interference, the kinds of mechanisms that we can that we can, uh, uh, you know, kind of bring together in that in that puzzle, so that we can have most of the pieces that would be required for companies to have funding. In the early stage, to have mentoring, uh, so that these very very young entrepreneurs and and uh, you know some of them don't have corporate experience, they can get all the guidance that they need through mentoring, and then have the different uh, capabilities in the ecosystem to fund them uh, through the different valleys of death. There's not just one valley of death in the early stage. There's multiple valleys of death, and in the in the in the uh, in the road, and and then. The, the last element that I would mention is that we have to take advantage of something that that the U.S. already has because the U.S. is like a continent, right? So the U.S., a company that starts up in Utah can actually find a buyer in, uh, you know, in Tennessee or, or a company that starts up in Boston can find a buyer in, uh, in, in New York, you know, and, and, and we have to think about this regionally too. So Chile, which is an incredible example that I think even something that we should emulate more than, than Silicon Valley, I think Chile has incredible things that we can learn from. Uh, take that region as a whole. Uh, our experience investing in the region also shows that there's similarities and, and, and there's things that we can take advantage of. All those synergies you know, through the Pacific Alliance, for example, Mexico, Colombia, Peru, and Chile uh, in that particular block, uh, you know, some of these startups are all solving common problems for emerging Spanish speakers, right? So. I mean, why not take advantage of that? So I think we should look at the particular strengths, look at the particular weaknesses, and, and kind of build the ecosystem locally and regionally around that, more than uh, copy things that are impossible to replicate. Thank you, Felipe. Lots of food for thought. Um, so I want to make sure that there is enough time uh, for us to, for everyone here to answer questions if they would like to, uh, and we can also go out and enjoy this uh, lovely New England evening. Um, so we have uh, two microphones here, and uh, I believe that we uh, also have some questions coming from the from the uh, from the internet. So uh, I would invite you to go ahead and uh, line up next to the microphones if you have a question for any of our panel members, or, or maybe the microphones will even come to you. I can line up. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so um, my question is more for Sandy, but if Clara or Felipe wants to go ahead as well. Yes. Uh, so my name, is, <laughs> my name is Luis Silva. Uh, I work at Google based out of California. And so Sandy said that opening data access in general is kind of the foundation for <laughs> maybe development, right? So maybe can you name areas of knowledge uh, or industries that you might consider that Colombian society is a little bit best positioned to thrive? And specifically, I will be interested to know in, uh, if blockchain could be one of those areas for, or industries for Colombia to thrive, and why? Well, so um, it's hard to say exactly what is a – calling industries is a famously bad thing to do. Um, However, there are certain technology developments that you have to be part of. So, you know, you had to be on the Internet, and then you had to do AI. And you do have to do AI, and you have to do blockchain. It's very speculative at this point, but it's clear that it will be a major force in um, transactions of all sorts, particularly supply chains, logistics chains, government services, where um, I won't describe it as corruption, but, but the different players have different incentives, and you need to have uh, a shared record among them. And that sort of uh, technology is, is key to 
efficiency, reducing cost, reducing fraud. So you have to be up to date on these things, absolutely. Also, you have to be up to date on IoT. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to manufacture silicon. It doesn't mean that you have to build blockchains. But you do have to build applications and industries that use the best practice, which is you know, AI, big data, blockchain, IoT. That's the, those are the sort of entry things that you have to have. And then you construct uh, local solutions that will hopefully turn global. I'll throw something in there. Um, I think the good news about developing countries is that there are gaps everywhere, right? So you have opportunities everywhere. But I'll, I'll talk specifically about companies, Colombian companies in our portfolio, so that you can get the sense for it's, it's never been easier to start up a company ever in history. I mean, you, you can start up a company anywhere and you can sell anywhere. So we have a SaaS uh, solution for call centers out of Manizales, and we're selling in 18 countries that solution right now. We have an IoT uh, enabler uh, type company out of Medellin. It's a very local uh, startup at this point, but their solution is a blueprint that you can replicate anywhere. We have a, a, a waste tech company that through uh, you know AI type technologies is helping us to characterize a very difficult waste stream in, uh, in, at this point in one city, but you can apply that. Eventually, to, you can extrapolate that to, to other solutions. And we have, a, um, we have a, uh, another uh, you know, cloud-based uh, solution that is almost uh, analytics-driven for, you know, for the energy technology. So I think that those are just real examples of startups in Colombia that are already leveraging you know, technology applying it and and hopefully starting to develop what will become a you know a, a, a develop a, a new a new business opportunity for you know for us uh, in the region so. and also from government uh, to find a different initiative to improve technologies for example Colciencias have a good initiative of open science in, in cooperation with the TIC ministry and in the last week, the uh, uh, National Department of Planning uh, designed and formulate, formulate the big data compass. Uh, this is important to develop technologies and innovation in our sector of Colombia. Thank you. And from this side. Okay. Um, buenas tardes. Good afternoon. My name is Juan David Reina. I am a research affiliate at MIT DLAP. Uh, we have been working in Colombia in several areas, uh, like post-conflict areas, post-acuerda, in San Andres de Tumaco, Nariño, San Jose de Guaviare, Guaviare, Conejo, Guajira, Fusacasuga, Cundinamarca. And one of the things that we have found is that extremely knowledge that the local communities have there, like Afro-Colombians, indigenous communities, peace hands there. So what is the role of local communities, especially in a post-conflict country, as we, we talked this morning, in the, in the knowledge uh, ecosystem? Because normally this uh, like theory or this practice, all the time is about like, uh, academia, private sector, government, but how to include local communities, especially in this framework of peace agreement. No, thanks. Uh, would any of the panel members like to address that in particular? Well, okay, so one, one of the things that we are doing with uh, many of the companies that we, that we have been looking at <coughs> is that we are um, creating this opportunity to uh, give accessibility to resources and, and, and services that, that communities didn't have before. That's not our core mission as, as a venture corporate fund, but we've been doing it indirectly in a way, right? So um, uh, what we see in that opportunity of, of, of um, giving access to energy in areas where there hasn't been any, or telecommunications where there hasn't been any, is the opportunity for those communities to have a connection to the outside, but in specific uh, examples, particular one company that we've been we haven't invested in yet, but it is allowing us to connect uh, rural off-grid communities through 
through local Wi-Fi networks is that once they get connected, they have uh, a new opportunity to apply knowledge that is coming to them or to share knowledge that they have locally. So that would apply more to, you know, to, to agro more than anything else that, that, we've been, that we've been seeing at this point. But we think that, you know, this, this shouldn't be limited just to, you know, to, to the big cities or to, you know, or to, or to the big, uh, you know, uh, uh, capitals. We think that when you are really developing, um, you know, access, accessibility in every sense to drinking water, to, to energy, to, to, to technology, you're going to be opening the doors for many other things, education, medicine, you know, a, a, lot, of, a lot of opportunities. And, and that really comes from, uh, again, this unprecedented opportunity that we have for technology to enable us to get there. So I think that, that would be the example that I would use to answer that. Uh, communities is very, uh, is very important, especially in the perspective of social innovation. Uh, called Ciencias, for example, have a good experience in the in two communities, in the two programs, uh, A Ciencia Cierta is the names, uh, and other is the uh, Ideas para el Cambio. This is program is the, to connect communities with universities and researchers to improve and to develop different programs. Uh, it's important to understand this is the double way. Communities have acknowledged and also universities and research have acknowledged. The idea is what is the adequate transfer for this is uh, acknowledged, taking into account research and taking into account the technology of community. So I think there's a couple of things that I've seen that are interesting. So um, my lab was involved in rolling out the educational program in Costa Rica, which was aimed at, uh, you know, five, eight-year-old kids to give them computer experience when they were very young. And over the years, that proved to be very powerful co for Costa Rica. So the the president uh, who brought Intel plant to Costa Rica uh, credited the fact that all of the children know how to do computer stuff uh, there with their being able to bring chip making uh, to, uh, to Costa Rica. In India, um, you saw uh, after school programs being encouraged. So the government opened up all the schools to to for-profit uh, entities that wanted to teach after-school programs in uh, computer literacy. So they, they spread very, very broadly. NIIT is one of the, the largest of that. Um, and I think that there are things like that, that the previous um, IT minister, or it was two, two ministers ago, um, I encouraged him to begin to provide access to all the villages and to provide free Wi-Fi. And he tells me that he made a good effort at that and that uh, to provide computer credentials and computer space to everybody. And that's the sort of thing you need to do, is you need to say, look, you're going to have a, a digital stake, digital um, uh, uh, abilities, uh, and then you have to encourage it in very young people. Uh, and then from the ground up. I, an example of something that's, that's really interesting is a friend of mine started a call center business uh, using government-provided internet where women in their homes could make money um, doing uh, translation of manuscripts, other sorts of texts like that, uh, so that even though they had kids and had to stay at home and, and they were in a village, they could earn money on their own. And that turned out to be a huge business in India. Uh, it was, I think, the number three business in the world like that uh, when he finally sold it to a large thing. But there's this trained population in villages that have reasonable educational credentials. They need access to be able to earn money. Uh, so the government should provide that sort of access, digital access, so that people can figure out ways to put their skills to use and have access to markets, earn money. 
Great. Always nice to uh, hear successful stories of business and social impact. Um, we'll take a question from this side now. If, you, uh, if you'd like to address it to a particular member of the panel, um, please uh, let me know or if, uh, if, if it's for, for the floor in general. All right. Uh, it's mostly for Clara and uh, Sandy. My name is Antonio Copete. I'm a, a postdoc here at the astronomy department at Harvard. Uh, and I've been thinking that we as scientists uh, tend to have this bias towards using data for everything, using data for understanding the world, explaining the world, advocating. And in this whole work, big work of, of, of building an innovation and knowledge infrastructure, I was wondering if you can speak about what are the things that we cannot do through data or what are the limitations of an exclusively data-driven data approach in doing this work? Well, the point of the data is not to be exclusively data. Data is an enabler. And typically, it's an enabler of services. Uh, so for instance, take the example of women doing transcription at home. It's, it's the woman knowing two languages and having time at home and a business setting up a relationship that will allow her to do that. But that only works if she can get her product in and out. OK, so the data is an enabler. And that's true of most data services, is that they're an efficiency or an enabler or something like that, as opposed to the service itself. So the service itself is intellectual, it's, it's people helping other people, uh, it's things like that, as opposed to, uh, you know, making computer chips or hosting data servers or something like that. It, it also is important because the cost of moving data to rural areas or to poor communities is much lower than the cost of moving physical things. So setting up a factory in a rural area is very difficult. You have to have trucks going back and forth and fuel and electricity, large amounts of electricity. On the other hand, if you can do something that's more of a service industry, you near, need fairly low cost infrastructure and an educated population. The educated population is the thing that you really want because that will over time turn into the basis of all sorts of innovations. So, so you want a way to support educating people, giving them opportunity. And in many, many cases, again, it's not the, the fact that it's digital, it's the fact that it gives access to people. Um, that said, there's also some things that are a little different. So for instance, that gentleman asked about blockchain. So there's ways of, of doing records that are less prone to fraud and corruption. Uh, and they happen to be digital. The, the fact that they're digital is not terribly important. The fact that they are fraud resistant is very important. Um, and so on and on and so on. So I don't see them, I don't see the mistake not, don't make the mistake that the service or the business is digital. It's an enabler of lots of things. Um, and it has properties that it can be done in very rural areas or very poor communities uh, with appropriate levels of education. <coughs> and so one of the things you really want to do is education. Clara, Felipe, would you like to comment? Uh, uh, the data is input f to formulate adequate uh, policies based on facts. This uh, is the importance of the data. Uh, in Colombia, the data is not easy because no, if, especially in the uh, departments with a high not development, the data is not possible. Uh, for this reason, for example, global uh, uh, regional innovation in this also include 25 departments and one city. In this moment, the idea is to improve the calculation for the cities. But the idea is the innovation is necessary to improve human resource and infrastructure in Colombia. And this side of the room next. Yes, uh, my name is Juan Azuero. Uh, I'm a Harvard Business School student, and my question was mainly for Felipe. Um, what is actually happening in Medellin that we see that is becoming a city, uh, such as an in innovative city? Uh, most of the venture capital funds are in Medellin, 
and we don't find these in, in any other region of, of Colombia. That was the first part of my question. And the second one is, if the money is not coming from the government, as we saw, they are investing 1% of the GDP, how can we incentivize uh, other companies to start doing what EPM is doing with their venture capital fund? Thank you. Good question. Look, I think, I think that the, the reason why uh, much of the, the venture funding is, uh, you know, is in, is in Medellin. Uh, there are portions of it, of course, in Bogota and other regions. But if you, if you actually do map out the concentration of venture funds, it's mostly uh, in, in Medellin. And I think that that comes from, from something that I mentioned earlier, which is the fact that, um, you know, a, the, the DNA of, of, uh, of the department and of the city is about, is about entrepreneurship, is about starting up. And because startups is not just about tech, startups is, is anything, you know. Uh, Antioquia is, a, is really at the end of the day a huge farm, right? And, and all of those families were, uh, you know, working the land and they were selling corn to make arepas. And they were selling the charcoal that you needed to bake the arepas. And then you needed somebody to sell that to. And so everybody in Antioquia is a salesperson, essentially. Um, and so, you know, when, when, you, when you have... A, a fu you know, you have a, uh, something like that, like a foundation. It really, it really kind of gets into the spirit of everything you do, and that's the reason why companies that used to be startups in the 60s and 70s are, uh, you know, today the biggest food company in Colombia, Nutresa, the biggest bank, Bank Colombia, the biggest cement company, Argos, the biggest uh, insurance company, Sura, and so on. Right. So that whole cycle. Um, really uh, is what is what goes into into this uh, spirit of not being afraid to uh, look for venture money and and invest venture money in uh, you know in, in in companies so I think I think that it just has a little bit to do with the culture and the openness that people have uh, to risk and to uh, and to failing uh, a little bit more than than in other parts we're not, we, we don't encourage that. We want this to be everywhere. We want venture funds to be, uh, you know, to be uh, omnipresent in, in, in the Caribbean coast, in the Pacific coast, in Valle del Cauca, in Santander, in, in the Amazon, you know, Janos Orientales, everywhere. We want, we want the right type of money to be available for the, the different types of, of ventures and, and companies and, and, and business endeavors and business ideas that can pop up anywhere. Um, and then the second part of your question about how do we encourage? Well, we've been we've been ambassadors of, you know, of, of corporate venture for five years now. Uh, we have spoken to multiple companies that have asked us how do we how do we set this up? How do we structure it? And we don't we don't see it as anything that is particularly mysterious or, or challenging. I mean, uh, really, all it takes is. Um, is the right sponsors and and the right owners, you know, uh, to to start up a corporate venture program. And what we do at EPM, which is what I've been mentioning all along, which is more of a venture program, is we don't even think that that's the only way to do it. You can set up uh, entrepreneurship programs. You can set up challenges with the universities and and like they do in California and all over the U.S. And you can have students solving big companies' problems, and from there, ideas can pop up as the university spin-offs. Uh, you can have, um, you know, incubators where you do, like, industry, uh, you know, incubators where all of the textile industry, you know, kind of comes together and accelerates ideas. You can do this in many ways. I mean, there's really no excuse not to do it at the end of the day. And it, it's usually not even a, a matter of money, because when you look at uh, what any big company has in terms of revenues and EBITDA and all that, they can definitely destine easily, uh, you know, what EPM has been, has been putting to work, $45 million for a big company like that, a multinational big company. I mean, that's, that's really not, they're probably losing more money uh, in toilet paper sometimes in, uh, you know, and in, in, in other useless things like that. So, so, you know, really, it's just about wanting to do it, you know, get your board together, get your advisors together, put together a plan and, and launch some flavor of, of program where you are encouraging ideas through investment and through mentoring and through the smartness of your capital 
so that those ideas can have wings and they can uh, disrupt whatever it is that you, that you wanted to disrupt. Great. Um, it's wonderful to see so many questions. Um, I think we'll have to make uh, the question from this side of the room the last question, and I would encourage everyone else to um, maybe ask their questions offline. I believe there's a moment for us all to, uh, to gather more informally, and it has the advantage that you can say what you really think to the panelists. Please. Uh, my name is Juliana Castro. I'm a student in the Master of Public Policy here at Harvard. Uh, my question is open for the panel, and it's like, even though the Colombian government has done some efforts in promoting entrepreneurship late, lately, it's far from having an ideal regulation. So what do you think is the most urgent change that needs to be done from the government to promote the creation of, of new companies? Thank you. Uh, let's start with Clara, Sandy, Felipe. Um, in this moment, government have different instruments to improve uh, innovation and technology in, in the industries. For example, Impulsa have interesting programs uh, to improve this uh, innovation and technological transfers in the industries. Uh, the problem is in the big industries have more investment in innovation and in technology. The problem is in the small and business in, in enterprise. It's necessary to analyze what is the situation. Uh, for example, the, in this moment, uh, the uh, indicators is only calculated for medium and big enterprise. In a small business, it's not possible to determine what is the potential of innovation. In this part, it's important to develop adequate instruments, especially to uh, begin entrepreneurships and a small and business enterprise. Would you like to add anything to that, Sandy? Yeah. I don't, you no. Know, um, there's lots of things you can do. I, I'll just give one little story. So um, there's a little country called Estonia that used to be part of the USSR, uh, and they broke away. Uh, and in Estonia, you sitting here with a, like a, your phone can sign up to be an, an e-citizen of the country, and you can create a company here in less time than this panel took. So I think the, the record is gaining citizenship in something like 12 minutes and starting a company in something like 18 minutes. Okay? When Britain voted for Brexit, they had some thousand British citizens sign up to be uh, uh, Estonian citizens also. It doesn't give you voting rights. It just gives you, uh, you, you identify yourself and show passports and things like that. And, and they uh, established companies there, which is not taxed, but it provides for um, an avenue for Estonia to communicate with the rest of the world and be involved in all these other businesses. And uh, they're very happy with it. You know, so, so you can be very innovative. I mean, just think about that. You know, less than an hour to set up a business uh, is, is amazing. And what Estonia does, just so you know, right, how do they profit? Well, of course, if you have a company in Estonia, you have very easy to use Estonian uh, auditors, Estonian bookkeeping, Estonian whatever. And so their little businesses make lots of money off of the business that you're starting. And they're very happy with that, of course. Thank you. I, I won't comment if I was one of those uh, British citizens <laughs> signing up for e Estonian yeah. citizenship. Would you like to add anything, Felipe? Uh, yeah, I think, I, think I, I would answer that question with, I wouldn't answer that question in a void. We have to remember that uh, one of the biggest, you know, uh, uh, barricades right now for Colombian businesses in general has been that taxation level has been going up. Right, so the tax structure, all the, the reformas tributarias have been very taxing on companies. I think that one quick way to, to, to promote investment and innovation would be a tax incentive. And that, that would be, there's a lot of tax investors in the U.S. for renewable energy, uh, you know, for other types of industries. But I think that one quick way to do that, if I could only choose one at this point because of where we are, where, where we've been taken to, 
from that standpoint would be tax incentives, which, you know, small ones exist for specifically renewable energy, Ley uh, 1715, but it's not enough. It's not enough because you don't have tax investors. You don't have, uh, it's not big enough so that you will entice uh, investors to do it for that particular reason. So where, where we are today, I think that would be uh, one idea. And this was a very long panel, so I think setting up a company in Estonia in less time than this panel would have been easy. <laughs> and Estonia didn't qualify to the World Cup, we did. <laughs> that seems as good a point as any to uh, draw, draw the panel to an end. So uh, thank you for all of, your, um, all of your questions and thank you to our panelists.